Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas. In our new study in the first letter to the Corinthians by Paul, we're going to take a look at uh, chapter 1, 18 through 31. We're going to take a look at uh, the concept of wisdom of God overlapping with the concept of people of God by Paul. He overlaps those two concepts in this uh, section of scripture. On block 1, we'll take a look at verses 18 through 20 the act of knowing and perceiving. In verse 18, the cross cannot be perceived by secular reason. Preaching the cross is perceived as foolishness by secular reason. The idea of the cross, the logos to staurao, to those who are spiritually lost, is an absurd idea. I got a few notes here from John MacArthur. The word of the cross includes the entire gospel, the message and the work. It's God's total revelation. And uh, the reaction in Corinth was similar to that in Athens. Uh, they sneered in rejection of Paul preaching the cross of Christ. And one thing that MacArthur pointed out, which I thought was really great, even Simon Peter did not understand the cross initially. It was only later that he fully understood the, uh, the cross, that the Messiah could be a crucified Messiah. Now note too, we'll take a look at the uh, cross perceived by the believers. For those who are saved, the cross is the power of God. And the uh, verb for saved, sozo, is used as a present passive participle. In other words, it is those who are saved and continually and, and are continually being saved. And the cross becomes the dunamis, the potential power of God himself. Now verse 19, we look at this perceiving as a being prophecy because Paul says uh, it is written that this uh, wisdom of the wise will be destroyed and their understanding will be brought to nothing. And that's taken from Isaiah 29, 14. So Paul says this was prophesied that uh, secular reason would not be able to apprehend the meaning of the cross. And these, this reasoning will be destroyed. The wisdom of secular wisdom will be destroyed. And... Uh, only the believers will be able to put together a true perception of the cross of Christ because they are empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to discern and to perceive that truth. But in verse 20, Paul says, uh, secular wisdom um, is the real foolishness. The cross is not the foolishness. Secular reason is the real foolishness. The wisdom of the world is made foolish by the cross of Christ and the faith of the believer, and the faith of the believer through grace. So initially we learn that from Paul that the act of knowing is a gift. The act of knowing is gift. It's not anything that secular reason can acquire. The act of knowing, and I, I mean spiritual knowing, the act of spiritual knowing you can't just acquire it on your own. You have to acquire it by grace and only by the grace of God through Christ can you acquire the act of knowing. Secular reason cannot reach it. Now verses uh, 21 through 23 in block 2, we look at the paradox of the gospel, the paradox of the kerygma. Kerygma means proclamation. The, wisdom, uh, the world's wisdoms, by the world's wisdom, God cannot be known. The wisdom of God cannot be known by world wisdom, by the gnosko of the cosmos. And it's only through the uh, proclamation, if you look at the 1D, Dietes uh, kerygmatas, 
by the supposed foolishness of the kerygma, the act of proclamation, the gospel is mediated. Now to secular reason, that is foolishness. But to the believer, we know that proclamation mediates the grace of God. The kerygma, or kerygmatos, the kerygma, proclamation of the gospel, mediates the act of knowing Christ. It actually mediates the act of knowing Christ in power. So kerygma is not foolishness to the believer, but it is foolishness to secular thought. And from there, it invites the response of faith. It uh, goes on to save those who go on believing, and it's used as a present active participle. So Paul's saying that the act of knowing leads to the response of faith, and believers are saved, and they continue in their believing. He uses the participle here. It's they believe, and they continue to believe. They believe, and they continue to believe in the truth of the gospel mediated by the proclamation, by the kerygma proclamation of gospel. Paul goes on in verse 22 to say that the Jews always require a sign of proof, and the Greeks always seek the wisdom of proof. So either um, a sign is required or a rational explanation of wisdom is required. But Paul emphatically says in verse 23, and this is the core of the truth from Paul, he says, we preach Christ as crucified, period. We preach Christ as crucified. We preach a crucified Messiah. That's a stumbling block to the Jews, but he says, we preach a crucified Messiah. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. We proclaim Christ crucified. And that is used as a perfect passive participle. In other words, Christ was crucified, and the salvation that results from it is a continuing and remaining salvation. But it was scandalon to the Jews. It was moria, foolishness, to the Gentiles. So we learn from Paul that the act of knowing is a gift of grace. It is a paradox, this gospel, this proclamation of the gospel is a paradox because the supposed foolishness is really the truth. It's the gift of grace, the gift of truth through grace, which cannot be perceived by secular reason. Let's take a look at uh, the third block, verses 24 and 25. Those who are called are those who will perceive the truth. It all goes back to the call by Paul. We talked about it before, but we have that that dialogue of call, the Klesis call of Christ and the Epikaleo invocation of the response. It's a dialogue of call that uh, abbreviates the act of knowing. And for those who are called, they receive the gift of spiritual perception. For those called by Christ, Christ becomes the power of God. Christ becomes the wisdom of God. Within the dialogue of call, the act of knowing takes place. 1D there. As a key statement, within the dialogue of call, the act of knowing takes place. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God is wiser and even more clear than man's reason. And the weakness of God, the Christ who after he emptied, emptied himself, of his equality with the Father, the weakness of God in Christ is more powerful than any power that man can muster up. Jesus Christ in his self-emptying, becoming a slave and a servant to bring about salvation, in his weakness he brought more power than any secular power ever. Therefore we have the triad, the dialogue of call makes possible the divine act of knowing. The secular reason remains foolishness and weak and unable to know God. And the uh, toys, clay toys, the called ones, are the ones who perceive God in Christ. 
That's your triad. I'll give it to you again. That's your triad. The dialogue of call makes possible the divine act of knowing. The secular reason is foolishness and weak. It cannot know God, unable to know God. Only those who are called can perceive God in Christ. There's your triad. There's your triad. It begins with that gift of knowing and the inability to know by secular reason and then understanding that it is those who are called, those who are the elect that are given the gift of spiritual perception, they can perceive God in Christ. That's going to move us on to uh, the second part of the lesson, which is going to be the people of God. This triad gives you Paul's concept of the wisdom of God. Now we want to look at that overlap with the people of God in column 4. So let's take a look at column 4 and take a look at the concept of the people of God. That's going to be chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. We're going to finish up the chapter here. Paul says, Not many after the flesh are called. God chooses the weak to confound others. Not many according to the flesh are called, are of the calling of the elect. Foolish things have been elected by God to shame or to dishonor the wise of the flesh, those who glory in themselves, those who boast in themselves. Now note too, base things have been chosen to bring other things to nothing, therefore the flesh cannot glory in itself. Things despised have been chosen, the least esteemed have been chosen, the least esteemed have been elected, to nullify things which uh, seem to be esteemed by the, those who uh, boast of themselves, of their secular wisdom and secular power. Paul says there can be no boasting of one's self. That is pride. No one can boast of themselves. No one can know God of themselves. Boasting of yourself is defeated and made null. Now note three. The elect are those who are in Christ. En Christo. Very important. For Paul, the elect are those who are in Christ. And by being in Christ, it's Christ who is made wisdom, made righteousness, made redemption for the elect. Therefore, Paul says, we glory in the Lord. We glory in Christ. You are, there's your key phrase, you are in Christo. You are in Christ. You are in Christo. And he has been made for you and unto you as Sophia Wisdom, the Kaisune Faithful Righteousness, Hagiasma Sanctification, Epilutrosis Redemption, and... Therefore, boast in the Lord, negate all pride of the self, negate that ego that wants to creep up, negate that ego, put that ego down, and boast in Jesus Christ. Because you are saved and redeemed and sanctified in Christ, en Christo, en Christo. Underline that a hundred times. For Paul being in Christo means you're redeemed and you're sanctified. That's the only way that you are redeemed and sanctified. You have to be in Christo. You have to be in Christ to receive redemption. Period. And that overlaps with the wisdom of God because you can't know God through Christ unless you receive that gift of grace and become a believer in Christ. They overlap. The wisdom of God and the people of God, those two concepts overlap in Paul. In this uh, section of Scripture from verse 18 to verse 31 of chapter 1, that closes up chapter 1, but we will have our recall triad next.